Welcome back to my annual education series. Today I'm doing another virtual interview with some new friends of mine in Thailand. So to start off, do you mind introducing yourself and tell us how long you've been with the Given Rehabilitation Project? Thank you so much. My name is Tanapat Payakapon. You can call me Tan. I am the Secretary General of the Wild Animal Rescue Foundation of Thailand. I have been unofficially helping with the foundation and the project uh, since start in 1992, but I am officially taking involved with this position for about nearly 10 years now. Gibbons are truly incredible animals. Exactly how many species of gibbons are in Thailand? Alright, gibbon in Thailand uh, can be found for four species, which is white hand gibbon, black hand gibbon, uh, pileated gibbon and sayamang, which can be found uh, in different parts of Thailand for this species. What other countries can people find gibbons living in? There are about 21 species of gibbon which can be found across Southeast Asia in many countries from China, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia for example. What kind of environment do these gibbons typically prefer? They keep on living in the forest, for sure. But almost entire life of gibbons, which is they can live up to 40 years of age, they mainly stay on top of the canopy. Rarely that in their entire lifetime that they have come to the ground. So basically they live on top of the canopy, surrounded by their favorite food source. Do all of the gibbon species in Thailand prefer the same forest habitat or do they prefer different kinds of forests? Uh, as I mentioned before, Thailand we have four species of gibbon uh, and they are living in different part of the country. But for example, white hand gibbon we can be found from the north of Thailand to the south of Thailand, which is pretty much uh, for pileated gibbon we can be in the center of Thailand, Sayamang we can lay on, found them on the south of Thailand and the black hand as well on the south of Thailand. Gibbons look like animals that are extremely adapted for lifestyle up in the trees. What adaptations do these animals have that makes them such specialists for climbing? Uh, Gibbon is a very unique species why, of wild animal. They have a long arm very powerful arm which can eat one arm of gibbon can equal to about three men and they have really long palm hand palm and legs as well and this is make them very unique the long arm make them very unique so that they can use for swing from tree to tree and also use for balancing when they walk on the branch with these gibbons being primarily arboreal what does their diet mainly consist of uh, mainly keep on there for day to day basic. They are looking for their favorite food, which is mainly they consume fruit for parity. The second is leaf, mainly the, the newly leaf that shooting. And also sometimes keep on to eat insect and ant. And also sometimes we observe them catching some bird that fly by and trying to eat them as well. But mainly fruits is their primary sort of food. Anyone who has probably seen gibbons has probably seen them swinging from vine to vine or tree to tree. Can you explain to us a little bit more about how that movement occurs? Okay, sure. Gibbon is very no, well known for their perfectly swing from tree to tree and that is how, how they actually travel from one place to another place. But also gibbon can, can also climb up tree, climb up and climb down very, very fast as well. And also sometimes gibbon they do drop from the high canopy to the lower part of the tree. At, but also sometimes gibbon also climb down to nearly leash to the ground level just to find some water source in the dry season as well. This is an answer that I really don't know myself, but for my viewers and for me as well, do you mind explaining the social structure and the family structure of gibbons? Gibbon and human are pretty much similar. So they are living as a family, not as a group. So it's cons basically it consists of their father, their mother, and their kid. Normally a group of five gibbons, no more than that. 
only sometimes that we find they live more than five five family members. Do these family groups of gibbons ever establish a firm territory or do they move wherever the food source is readily available? All right, it's a good question about territory of the Kibon family. Uh, I would say it like this. Kibon, they tend to stay around their favorite tree. This favorite tree is their food source, so they tend to trying to protect food sort or food tree not allowing another family member to come across and trying to steal the food sort it's just like we are having our favorite restaurant so we're trying to just go there and try to protect no one come and rob our restaurant so but because in the forest uh, their favorite food tea cannot produce the fruit all year round, so that is seasonal about it. So it depends on what type of forest. But in the south of Thailand, we have three seasons, so mainly they tend to change their territory depending on their favorite food sort about two or three times per year and they are also trying to protect the food sort and this is how we call Gibbon territory. Gibbon territory it mainly depends on their food sort and they are surely trying to protect this territory. Whenever I go to a zoo there are two primates that are loudest upon all others. Those are howler monkeys and gibbons. How do gibbons vocalizations play a part in their family and social structures? Uh, when gibbon sing Firstly, they seem to communicate between uh, the member of the family, just like the kids sing to their mom a little bit when they're hungry. But most of the time when we hear them uh, doing some great call that is so loud, sometimes we can hear it so far from like four kilometers, and that they try to announce their territory, or sometimes they try to challenge another gibbon individual gibbon on another side of the mountain not to come across you know but also sometimes they use it to call for mate so they know when when they reach the the sexual maturity that they're looking for partner they know where to go to find them when do these animals reach sexual maturity and when will they have offspring okay gibbon basically when when they reach sexual maturity which is the age about six to eight uh, when they find their partner, they're pregnant for about seven months, every two years, okay, every two years. And they can only produce one baby gibbon, but also sometimes we have uh, a record of the gibbon having a twin baby as well. But uh, when they produce every two years, this is also depends. Sometimes when they're pregnant and their baby die, they can reproduce much faster according to that case. What kind of animals out in the wild would try to eat a gibbon? So snake is their major predator that we often found uh, trying to eat gibbon. Snake and sometimes eagle as well. Apart from human, snake, eagle, sometimes gibbon when they fight between male and male, that also one cause of the death of gibbon because when the other one that lose the fight that drop from the top of the canopy to the ground which is about 30 meter and many times that this injures caught them the death of life. Do you mind explaining to my viewers what the main mission of the Gibbon Rehabilitation Project is? Uh, the Gibbon Rehabilitation Project we estimate with a very strong mission of rescue, rehabilitate and release Gibbon where they were pushed to extinction in the wild. And that's our mission that we have been committed for nearly 30 years now. Are all of the gibbons in Thailand considered threatened or endangered? Yes. Yes, all four species of gibbon now is considered in endangered. How many gibbons has your facility rehabilitated back to the wild? Since we estimate the Gibbon Rehabilitation Project, we have been rescuing more than 250 Gibbons. But not all of that has part our first step, which is medical check. For example, when we receive, when we rescue Gibbon, the first thing we do, we have to do all the medical check. And unfortunately, about 70% not even part this step because they 
the blood test they contain many diseases from HIV, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, herpes, TB, rabies, and those who do not pass the first stage, we do not release them back in the wild because we do not want to spread the disease in the wild. But those who pass it, we put them to the quarantine, then we put them in the rehabilitation zone, which is normally it takes about five years for each individual given before we can release them back into the wild. Unfortunately, as is true for most, if not all, rehabilitation centers, there are some animals that cannot be returned to the wild. Do you house these animals at your facility for the rest of their life then? Some of them become permanent residents of our facility, but because our facility has limited sources, so most of them that do not pass the, the, the first date or cannot be released, we move them and we return them to government facility where they have much larger space to take care of this gibbon for life. But for our facility, we only focus for those who pass all, all the quarantine and who have a chance to be released in the wild. What are some of the biggest threats to the given populations in Thailand? Surprisingly, the biggest threat to the Kippon population in Thailand is not about deforestation, but the major reason is come from the tourism industry. Because uh, many people that come to Thailand, they want to have a chance to see some wildlife, and Kippon is one of them. So the illegal business and illegal black market and those poacher they they went they go into the forest and they kill the entire family to get the baby and they sell this baby into the black market and then people bought it and use it as an illegal business for illegal photo pop so that people who come to Thailand they have a chance to see this little baby keep on and take a photo. And this is the major threat that Thailand are facing about keep on right now. Why is it so important to save Thailand's gibbon species and to educate people about gibbons? This is a good question why it's important. It's not about the gibbon, but I think it's also go toward all species of Thailand. But for us, we focusing on gibbon because gibbon are the most intelligent wildlife of all wildlife in Thailand and is one of the more difficult wildlife species to be rehabilitated and returned to the wild. We also believe that if we can successfully do this to keep on, we can also pass this knowledge on to another species and adapt some techniques so that we can let's kill, rehabilitate and return another species as well. What are some ways that your organization teaches people about the given population status? Okay, we have been also focusing on educating people across Thailand for nearly 30 years now. Every year we also went to school to educate children and also we went to the, the tourism destination to educate tourists and also at our center we have our visitor center where tourists come they can also learn so much about the Kippon in our care and also our general research result that we have been doing for nearly 30 years. Is there anything else that you would like to share with my viewers? Alright, thank you so much everyone for watching this and learn about Kippon in Thailand. So, what I want to pass on to you and I want you all to pass on to another people is that when you come to Thailand or visit another country, try not to have your photo taken with this illegal wildlife photo pop business. Because in order to get one little baby Kippon, Porsche have to go into the forest and kill the father first and then kill the brother, sister, and then kill the mother so that the mother drop from the top of the canopy and they can get the baby. The average research that we have been doing about this culture is saying that we have to kill about 10 gibbon in order to get just one little baby gibbon. So please bear in mind, if you come to Thailand having your fantastic holiday, try not to have your photo taken with this illegal business and that's one way that you can help keep on population in Thailand. Thank you so much for helping me put together another awesome virtual interview. It, again, I really like doing these virtual interviews because I can't travel to all these places that I get to do interviews at now. Unfortunately, COVID-19 kind of slowed down all my in-person interviews, but 
these virtual interviews have been a whole different avenue for me. I think that's really cool and I really enjoy doing them. So thank you again for helping make this video possible. And thank you guys for watching this week's video. Don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and as always, I will see you next week.